How many photographers do you know who hold the Guinness Book of Records for the largest plastic sculpture made from reclaimed plastic, including 168,037 straws? This week, I'm going to chat with an incredibly talented artist, photographer, and marketing genius whose work is guided by a social and environmental compass, Mr. Benjamin Von Wong. Stay tuned. You're watching Tog Chat Live, the only live show dedicated to the hows and whys behind creating consistently great photographs. Here's your host, Joe Edelman. Hey gang, welcome to episode number 238 of Tog Chat. I do hope that you're all healthy and of course, still wearing a mask, practicing your social distancing. My regulars, you've already started. If you are here live, check in and leave a comment. Let me know you're here and where you are in the world. And if you're watching the recorded show, leave your details in the comments below the video. Already I got Alan here in ice cold Denmark, Joe in Michigan, Lynn in New York. Let's see, I got Jim in Maine. We got Eric down in Texas, Alvin in Virginia. I got Ed from Oregon. Who else here? Uh, John Edward in the Netherlands, John in Harrisburg, Robert in New Jersey. We got people here from all over the place. Kevin just got here from El Segundo in California. All of you, thank you so much for being here. You are all part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch or listen to Talk Chat every week. And for that, I'm gonna work really hard to help you with your photography in the next 60 minutes. And it would help a lot more people find out about Talk Chat if you could do me a solid, Hit that thumbs up below the video. You know I'm going to ask, right? The more thumbs up, the more YouTube will recommend the show to other photographers. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to hit that share button. It's right down there. Yep, good. Let your photography friends know that we're streaming live on YouTube right now. Or of course, you can share that link that I just dropped in the chat window. It is tog.chat slash live. Twitter, Facebook, they're the fastest, fastest way to go ahead and get the word out. So please do me a solid, let people know about the show. My apologies there. I'm trying to get the next link and it wasn't copying. So, all right. Remember, download the Talk Chat Photography Podcast every week. Just do it. Download it. I'm going to share the link for you in the chat. It's also already in the show notes below. Make sure you check it out. It's a great way to get your weekly fix while you're editing or you're retouching. And each episode of the podcast includes content that you're not seeing here on YouTube. In fact, it's got completely different Q&A questions. In addition to more of the interview that you're not going to see here, lots of stuff. So check it out. The show is available on iTunes, Google, Spotify, Amazon, iHeartRadio, Pandora, pretty much anywhere that you like to get your podcast fixed. In fact, We've moved up in the charts. We are now in the top 75 of all visual arts podcasts on the Apple charts. Pretty cool, huh? And that's all due to you guys. Thank you. Next stop is a Tog Chat exclusive interview. My guest today is a Canadian artist, Mr. Benjamin Von Wong. Now, I've already called him so far a photographer, uh, an artist, a marketing genius. I believe he is all of those things and actually a whole lot more. On his website, he describes himself as an artist focused on amplifying positive impact. And think about those words, an artist focused on amplifying positive impact. After you listen to him, that statement will make so much sense. Benjamin Von Wong's work lies at the intersection of fantasy and photography, and he combines everyday objects with shocking statistics. His work has attracted the attention of corporations like Starbucks, Dell, and Nike, and has generated over 100 million views for causes like ocean plastics, electronic waste, fashion pollution. Most recently, he was named one of Adweek's 11 content branded masterminds, and he also hosts his own podcast, the Impact Everywhere podcast. Now, seriously, I want you to listen closely. We are about to take a deep dive 
into the mind and the career of a truly brilliant creator. So let's get right into it. Benjamin, I have to thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk with me. I, I'm going to fanboy for just a minute. I, I have long been just honestly overwhelmed by what you do and your work. You, you are honestly, you're kind of a rock star for what you do. But people think I'm talking about just the photography and I'm not. So we're going to get into that. But thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it for having me, man. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I, I am really, really honored. So for those folks that maybe have been living under a rock and have not heard your name and seen some of the incredible projects that you can, that you have worked on, could you just take a minute and introduce yourself to my audience? I don't, I know you don't call yourself a photographer, so I don't want to use the labels. I want to let you label yourself. <laughs> it's actually really, really hard to do, but let's give it a shot. The work that I create lives on the intersection of fantasy and impact. I create art that, uh, that, that looks like it's photoshopped. Um, the purpose of the art that I create is to ignite conversations around different social issues that are, um, that are important in the world today. Uh, the work that I've created has generated over 100 million views for different causes like fast fashion, ocean plastics, electronic waste. Um, and I do a little bit of everything. I'm a little bit of a one-man agency from the pre-production, the production, the shooting, the editing, the marketing, the press kits, the launches, the video editing. Like I do a little bit of it all. And I find it really, really difficult to put what I do in words. <laughs> I, understandable because there, there really are so, much, so, so many layers to it. I mean, one of the things that stands out to me when I, I see your body of work, you clearly have kind of an, an underlying both social and environmental compass to the work that you do, which I think is really admirable. But um, if we can strip it down just to the photography for a minute, and then I want to get into the projects and the creativity behind those. Tell me about your, your path in, in photography. I mean, how, how did you get started? And, and is, is that even for that matter, is that what got you started? Was the photography an afterthought? Yeah. So uh, it's it's a pretty long story because I've now been doing this for a decade. Uh, so I'm getting old. <laughs> the story used to be a lot shorter. <laughs> but uh, I studied as a hard rock mining engineer. So I don't have a you know academic background in photography. I studied hard rock mining engineering. And when I was on one of my work terms in Winnemucca, Nevada, which is about an hour away from Black Rock City, which is Burning Man, so super in the middle of nowhere, a girl broke up with me and I needed to find a way to keep myself busy. And I just thought, you know what, I'm going to buy a camera. I'm going to learn how to take pictures of the stars. So that's how I got into art, basically. And photography was something I did on the evenings and weekends. It was, it was fun. It was enjoyable. It was pleasant. Uh, it was sort of an all access pass. I could go backstage. I could make friends. I could talk to people because I had this I guess this device that just gave me some reason to ignite conversations with people. And over time, uh, I, I kind of went through the whole event route, the wedding routes, portrait routes, and then eventually just started realizing that what I really loved was creating these fantastical images, these productions, if you will, of cool things, just things like special effects and, and, and dancers and stunt people and things like that. And, um, in 2012, I decided to quit my day job and it wasn't because I wanted to become an artist. It was sort of <laughs> never the goal. I just realized one day that I didn't want to be an engineer for the rest of my life. So I, I, I woke up and I was like, if I don't, like, I don't know what to do with, with in my life, but in 10 years, if I don't do something now, I'm going to be at a bigger desk, uh, earning a little bit more money, uh, doing something that I really still don't care about. And so I, I, I decided to quit and, and I just wanted to travel, but it turns out that photography is the easiest way to travel. I could, <laughs> I could give, I could offer to teach a workshop to a photo club and that would get me like a free plane ticket. And then I would do this workshop and I'd make a bunch of friends. And now I had a bunch of sofas to sleep on, I had a bunch of people to collaborate with. And I could just hang out there until the next opportunity came to speak at another conference or another workshop. And I just kind of bounced around from that point forward. And this is like early days, 2012. And I was you know, this is when F-stoppers just started coming out onto the playing field. And I, I had 
you know, I was making behind the scene videos and I was con consistently getting featured on F stoppers, DIY photography, SRR lounge, and then eventually Petapixel. And that visibility just gave me enough traction to keep going. And I think so much of art is about just, just not necessarily thriving, but just keeping your head above water for long enough to find your path. Right. And, and I think slowly but surely I started to become a little bit more interested in this idea of a career. I wanted to see whether I could make it. There's sort of this dream that all creatives I think have, which is to get paid to do what you do best and to be recognized for what you do. And, and I had that goal too. And so I stumbled into the commercial photography world. Um, I really wanted to find ways to stand out because I didn't want to just create um, I didn't want to be a technician. I wanted to be an artist. I think there's a slight difference there. And, um, and, and I, and I got there pretty quickly. I think by 2015, I, I was shooting a global campaign for Huawei. And in this one campaign, I earned more money than my entire career combined at that point, because it was one of those global licensing gigs and it was just massive, 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 massive. And when I got to the top of that mountain, I was like, wait, is this it? Is, is this, is this all there is? Like, what do I do next? I just get a bigger client with, to do this, to do a bigger project to earn more money. And it just felt like a very, it, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't feel like all that was cut out to be. You just spend a lot more time in meetings. You spend a lot more time talking to people. Um, you spend a lot, you have a lot of restrictions. Like people think that the more money you have, the more options you have, but it's actually the more money you have, the more liability you have, and the more, the more risk averse people tend to be. And so it, I don't know. It, it, and it felt, it felt like earning money for money's sake. And it, uh, and, and, and I didn't know where it was going to head. Like the, the pathway forward at that point wasn't clear. And I started to think about all the different projects that I had done that I was most proud of. And there were invariably all the projects that were around impact around making a difference in other people's lives that I personally resonated with the most. Um, and one example of that would be a video that I had made in 2014 for a little girl who was dying of a terminal degenerative brain disease. And this family reached out to me, they're complete strangers and just said like, Hey, we saw that you can make things go viral. You know, our, our daughter's dying and we were wondering if you could help us make a fundraising video to, um, to fundraise for a cure. And I was like, Oh, cool. I'm going to fly over, stayed on their sofa, made a video. And within a month, it raised a million dollars. By the end of the year, it became the most funded campaign on GoFundMe. In, in the history of the platform at $2 million. And out of the ashes of that, like an entire foundation was born. And it was just like, wow, this is like, I want to do projects like this. Like this is what storytelling and art and creativity should be used for. And so in, you know, by the end of 2015, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to quit photography and I'm going to move into documentary filmmaking. Um, because I was like, this is how you make a difference. And um, after doing it for a little while, I realized actually like telling depressing stories all the time of charities that need help is just like not really that fun. Um, I don't, I don't think it really like scratches the itch and uh, of creativity that I kind of had. And so then sort of embarked on this mission to figure out how to combine the two. And um, so combining fantasy and, and impact was not really obvious. I think when we think of impact, we think of really like grimy, sad images. And so I just kind of had to, I bumbled around. I basically told myself, I am not going to take any project creative paid or unpaid that doesn't have some kind of an angle to it with impact. And so I just, I tried, I tried, I failed. I knocked on doors, I got rejected and eventually stumbled into environmental projects. Um, most probably because my girlfriend <laughs> is, was more of a hippie uh, than I am. I think I've overtaken her a little bit now. Um, not that it's a competition, but uh, you know, the first project that we did together, she, recommended that I use storms as a metaphor for climate change. And, and it was just an excuse to go storm chasing really. But as a result of doing that project, you know, you can't just talk about a problem. You have to understand it. So I was watching a bunch of documentaries and it's like, you know, climate change is an issue, but, but how much do you really know? How much, how, many, how much attention did you really spend looking at it? So we, we see things, but we don't really look at them. And, and I think that's when things, you know, I just got sucked down that rabbit hole, you know, one project led to another. And the more I, paid attention, the more I learned and the more I couldn't turn away. And that's sort of how my work has slowly grown and been influenced over time. So you're, you're also kind of an eternal student, which 
which I love because that fuels and motivates a lot of what you do. So I, I want to back up a little bit. There was a couple things in there. Um, obviously, you're you, or at least to hear your story, you, you're not really afraid to take chances in terms of life altering. Let's go in a different direction with my life. Did you ever find yourself um, along the way, kind of questioning that decision in terms of? You know, I had this really big job right out of the box, made more money than I've ever made, and now it's not coming as fast. And if you did, how did you work through that? Because I think that's something that a lot of people are afraid of taking, you know, taking that step away from the day gig. What if I get to that point and and how do I handle that? I think that my self-doubt is omnipresent. Like it never goes away. However, it isn't tinged with regret. Does that make sense? Sure. So I still don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing and how it's all going to work out and whether or not I'm making the right decisions in the present. But I don't really tend to look to the past and go like, oh, I should have done X or Y or I should have done, you know, what would life have been if I had taken this other path? Um, I get, I'm most excited when I feel a sense of alignment, when I feel on the edge of possibility. I think when you when you see kind of, let's say, let's say, and I think everyone has these, like these, the beginnings of an epiphany, you kind of start to see how your life might just make sense. And it's like the sparkling light off in the distance. And then you start running towards it. And then and the closer you get, the more you realize it was probably a terrible idea because you didn't realize how difficult it was going to be all along the way. But that light is still kind of there. So you, so you just keep going and you don't really question like, well, why did I walk towards it in the first place? Cause it was there and it was alluring and it was interesting. And you were following something. And, and, and in that moment, that thing was true. Right. So, so it, it's, it's not tinged with regret. Um, but there is always a question of like, well, based on what I've learned so far, what do I do next? And of course the experiences you've had in that journey will slowly kind of influence your confidence, your, you know, your, your abilities, your decisions, and so on and so forth. You had gone down the rather traditional path, doing portraits, doing weddings, all of those things. And then along comes this big commercial job, which really, you know, kind of sets you off in a different direction because it, you know, gives you an awareness of how much you can make. How do you get that job? Like, how do you go from, okay, I'm kind of doing the grind and I'm doing my weddings and I'm doing all that. And what was it for you? Maybe number one, that set you in that direction, but number two, what was, what was kind of the key to you getting that gig? Was it just a piece of luck an acquaintance? How'd that come about? Mm. There's always luck, but luck is also designed, right? And in some capacity. So if you're shooting weddings and portraits your entire life, and that's the work you're putting out, and that's what you excel at, and you're hoping to transition to shooting, I don't know, the Super Bowl, um, you're, it, luck is not going to favor you. I mean, <laughs> what are the chances that someone sees a, a baby portrait and goes like, oh, wow, this guy's going to have potential shooting the Super Bowl. So what you put out into the world and how you tell the story of who you are and what art you create and what you want to do will influence the kind of luck that comes in. Um, I have always gravitated towards doing things that nobody else was doing. Partially, I think it's how I grew up. I just always wanted to stand out as a kid. I wanted to be louder than the, the others. I was always the weirdest person in the room. And, and I think that's a characteristic trait that, that I kind of unconsciously kept with me, but it really solidified after I met Chase Jarvis, I think in 2012 or 2013, where after <laughs> convincing him to look at my portfolio for a little while, he he gave, he gave me back my, my work and said, you need to figure out what the one thing in the world you can do better than anyone else is. And from that point forward, you'll never have to worry about money ever again. Now, I don't think that's entirely true. <laughs> At least it hasn't been in my case. Uh, the money certain has, it certain ha certainly hasn't been automatic. Um, however, I, when you create work that no one else is doing, it means that when somebody wants exactly that, you can ask for a lot more money, right? But if anyone else could do it, then you can't ask for as much because you have less negotiation power. Now, it also means that people are less likely to search for the work that you're doing because they don't even know it exists. So it comes with a little bit of a trade-off, right? I think, 
I think for you to be discovered and for luck to favor you, not only do you need to do good work, you need to do good work that is discoverable. And so somewhere in that lies a balance uh, of, of good, discoverable, in alignment with what you actually want to do what, and, and what you care about. Um, and I think I, you know, when I discovered that the commercial photography world, and, and this might be, I think this is changing now, but back in 2010, and I think this, it was even more so back in like the 2000s, like if you were at the top of your game, uh, the amount of money you could earn per commercial job was phenomenal. So really you could choose to work, uh, let's say a thousand dollar gigs all year long, or you could like aim for like the 10,000, hundred thousand dollar gigs and work one, two, three, four, five times a year. And I just chose sort of early on in my life that what I thought was most exciting was to create low frequency, high impact pieces of work. And that's just something I have stuck to. Is it the right or wrong decision? I don't know, but you know, with every decision comes consequences. And so you just have to kind of accept that this is the life that I have decided to choose. And, you know, I could always change. I could always go back to doing TikTok videos and little catchy things if, if that was truly what I wanted to do. Um, but as I get older, I'm like, no, I think I made the right decision. Uh, that's, that's a great answer. So, you know, it goes without saying you are not just an incredible photographer, but I would propose that you're also somewhat of a, a marketing genius. Um, quite a bit of what you talk about, even the idea of telling your story in that personal branding, there's a lot of marketing woven in, you know, your, your storyline here, but you're an engineer. So by trade and by education. So where did this marketing genius come about? Or are you one of those people that are just truly blessed with kind of like, I get it, the self-promotion or thinking outside the box, even for a client, how much work was involved in getting you to that point? I don't think I'm a natural storyteller, actually. Um, I do think that it was something that I had to learn one step at a time. I think because if you go back in time and so on Flickr, for example, you can go look at my work from 2007 or 2008 onwards. My entire archive of my growth is there. And you can read the description of some of my earlier stuff. And they're not interesting. Like, I am not a good writer. I'm not a good storyteller. You can look at earlier videos that I made on YouTube. I am not that good. Like, if I had the level of, I think, um, the ability to make anything interesting like let's say Casey Neistat or a, a Peter McKinnon style individual who is just truly like a, a gifted storyteller, I think I would be far more successful than I am today. I think I'm where I am in spite of my, uh, my, my skills as opposed to as a result of them. <clears throat> so where I am in marketing and how I've managed to brand myself is, 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 a byproduct of just consistently trying and getting better and finding the little quirks and studying the patterns that have emerged that have been successful and discarding the ones that don't. Um, I would say it's merely like blind persistence that has gotten me to where I am today. So I spend, a, I think I just spend more time than the average person thinking about the story. It isn't so much that I am better at it. I just pour a lot more time and energy uh, in revisions and really tweaking like, in a behind the scene video, the first 30 seconds are so important. And I, I will spend weeks working on 30 seconds of video to make sure that the visuals match the music, match the, match the voiceover. And, and it, it kills anyone that works with me. Like they hate it <laughs> because it's just so hard for them to, to play along with that. Um, so, uh, so there, there are principles there are books you can read. Uh, Contagious is a really good book by Jonah Berger. Uh, um, Make It Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. They talk about uh, the importance of, let's say, emotions. There are active emotions and passive emotions. You don't want people to feel sad after they watch something because sad makes people want to turn away. Uh, outrage and disgust make people want to click on something and share something. Shock and awe, inspiration, like these are also active emotions which, which, which get people to want to do something. You know, we, you can look at um, algorithms and you can see that, oh, the average person only takes two seconds before they decide whether or not they're going to continue watching a video 
What does that mean? Well, that means your two, your first two seconds better be really, really good. And so there's these, like, I think my storytelling chops are a byproduct of just paying attention to the engineering side of it and trying to deconstruct it as opposed to an innate talent. I mean, that, gosh, there's a couple directions I want to go here. So I'm trying to pick, trying to pick which one do I want to get in there. There's a word that keeps coming to my mind as I listen to you and you haven't used the word. So I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but at least from my experience woven through your story of experiences and things that you've tried and the way you've tried them, there has to have been failure. Oh, tons of failure. I'm still failing. So, <laughs> you know, we, we live in a time period where um, maybe it's just more awareness, maybe it's just more people, but failure is something that really, it handcuffs a lot of people. It creates a lot of anxiety. It prevents a lot of people from really achieving their goals because they, they really are just simply fearful of that failure. How do you deal with it? Because obviously you're putting yourself in a lot of different situations where not only is there a high potential for failure, but clearly just the learning curve you've gone through and to do it in 10 years. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I, I get it at your age. That seems like a long time, but you know, so how, how, how do you deal with that? I'm trying to think of like how I want to reply to this question, right? Because there is there would be like the scripted answer where you say, well, it's, you know, the only way to success is to fail multiple times. And if you can fail more than other people, then, you know, you'll have a greater chance of success. And, and there's all these like conventional wisdoms that I'm sure everyone has heard. And I'm trying, and I think it would be interesting to like give maybe a more vulnerable answer. Uh, so. And that, is where I'm going to leave you hanging because I really want you to hear the rest of that answer and honestly, the rest of the entire interview. So I will tip you off. The podcast is live now. It's already there. So if you're bored staring at me, you can go ahead and hear the rest of it right now. I'm going to put the link in the chat window for you. There it is. And also it's down in the show notes. And I will tell you right now, regardless of your genre of photography, you don't want to miss the rest of Benjamin's interview. I guarantee you, you will be inspired. Okay. So a couple quick updates for you all. Uh, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., I will be, whoops, I'm on the wrong tab there. Let's switch tabs and go here. I'll be teaching a class, uh, two hours, live online presentation, The Secret powers of raw files. So if you struggle with knowing which sliders and settings to use when you're processing your photos and you want to make your images look their best, this is a presentation for you. It is an interactive live web presentation where I'll walk you through my raw processing techniques and the importance of creating your own system or workflow to achieve consistent results with your photographs. The demo is done in Adobe Camera Raw, which has exactly the same controls as Adobe Lightroom. And the details and the suggestions from the presentation also apply to the basic processing capabilities of software like Capture One, Luminar, DxO, Affinity Photo, Darktable. We'll be reviewing the real reasons for shooting in Raw, an in-depth understanding of the Camera Raw controls and what they do, why you shouldn't rely on auto, to shoot your pictures, but yet you should still try it anyway when processing your photos. Talk about the importance of having a system so that you're establishing a consistent workflow and also something that so many photographers struggle with, and that is sharpening to make your images look their absolute best on the web. I can promise you, your work will greatly benefit from this simple system that I'll teach you in the presentation. So the registration, it's only $10 for this two hour live learning session. I have a link in the description. I will also go ahead and share it here in the chat window for you. Uh, if for some reason you are busy tomorrow night and you can't make it, you do have the option to sign up, pay the registration fee, and then about an hour after the presentation concludes, you'll receive an email with a watch link, and that will give you 48 hours to be able to view it as a replay. And also really quick before we move on, I want to let you know about some new features 
that are available for the podcast. If you've been following along on the podcast, in fact, let me just refresh the page real quick. So um, if you visit the podcast on uh, my website, you'll notice the player looks a little bit different if you've been there before. The backstory is simply, I changed my hosting service so that I could provide you some new features. So one thing for those of you that maybe don't like to listen and don't like to watch, but want to be able to read, the entire transcript of the podcast is now available. But here's the other time saver for some of you, because I know a lot of you have kind of your favorite features, the things that you want to listen to out of the podcast, but you don't want to listen to all the other stuff. So from your web browser, while you're looking at the player, you'll see this little chapter icon right here. Just click on it. And it's set up in chapters for the, with the timestamps for the show opener, the interview, the photo quote, talent under 30, or the talk chat Q&A. All you have to do is click on it, and it's going to start playing right at that point. And I mentioned this earlier. I'll mention again. The Q&A in the podcast, obviously, it's live, so it's pre-recorded. These are questions that have been filtered into me from different sources. These are not the questions that you're going to hear tonight. So you might want to check that out, okay? It's time for this week's photo quote and featured photographer. Be a student of humanities, because if you are, it makes you a more sensitive recorder of life. This quote comes to us from the Armenian-born portrait photographer extraordinaire, Yusuf Karsh. And these are words that have served me well as a photographer. And coming from Mr. Karsh, I would suggest that there is no better source of guidance. During his iconic career, he held one, excuse me, 15,312 sittings. He produced over 250,000 negatives and he left an indelible artistic and historical record of the men and the women who shaped the 20th century. I mean, you can see as I scroll through this page, many of Karsh's portraits are the definitive images that we remember. Ernest Hemingway, Winston Churchill, Fidel Castro, Albert Einstein are just a few of the examples. If you think of a photograph of these people, you are probably thinking of a Karsh portrait. Born in 1908, Karsh opened his first portrait studio in Ottawa, Canada in 1932. Throughout his life, Karsh photographed, quote, anyone who was anyone, unquote. By the time he retired in 1992, more than 20 of his photos had appeared on the cover of Life magazine. Karsh's photos, as you can see, were known for their use of dramatic lighting, which became the hallmark of his portrait style. I encourage you to study as much as you can about Mr. Karsh and his techniques. It will definitely impact the way that you approach photographing people. I have a link to his website in the description below the video, and I'll go ahead and I will drop the website link into the chat here for you, okay? And this week's talent under 30 photographer is Ronnie Garcia. Ronnie Garcia is a 29-year-old fine art portrait photographer based in Barranquilla, Colombia. And I know I probably butchered that town name. I apologize. Ronnie's work, it's vibrant, it's surreal, and it's emotional. He went to school for graphic and multimedia design, and that is very obvious in his images. What's not obvious in his images is that he didn't pick up a camera until age 24. That's right, he's only been shooting for five years. Be sure to check out Ronnie's work. The links to his website and Instagram are in the description below the video. And believe me, it's difficult not to get lost in the realism of his concept. Just brilliant work. And folks, you can help me out and hold the door open for a younger photographer. If you know of an incredibly talented photographer of any genre under the age of 30 who's creating exceptional work, please share his or her Instagram handle with me so that I can check them out and possibly feature them here on Talk Chat. 
And gang, when you do visit the Instagram profiles of these young photographers, please follow them. Understand that they are at a point in their careers where the follows and the likes do count because that helps to get their excellent work noticed by editors and creative directors. And the simple fact of the matter is many advertisers in today's world are interested in social followings and influence for the people that they hire. That applies for models, that applies for photographers, and pretty much all of the talent that is working on a project. So make sure you give them that follow, okay? It's time for some problem solving. The Todd Chat Q&A. All right, so I have one question that came in early tonight from my Talk Chat Facebook group. And of course, if you haven't joined the group yet, I really have no idea what you're waiting for. It doesn't cost anything. I have the link in the show notes. Every week I do an image review. Uh, so if you'd like my feedback on your photos, check it out. So the question that I have, and by the way, I have a cool new feature for our Q&A here coming up in just a second. The question I have comes from Joe. When tethering, is it best to use the camera brand tether software for your camera? Or does it really matter with how advanced the cameras are and the other software that's available, such as Capture One? Joe, honestly, it, it depends. The reason I say that is, depending on your camera brand, you may not be able to get support from different pieces of software. So you guys know that I'm an Olympus shooter. I use the Olympus capture software for the tethering portion. In other words, to connect for uh, my camera because the other softwares like Capture One, they don't support the Olympus cameras. Ironically, Capture One supports Olympus files. I can open Olympus files. I can work on them in Capture One, but I cannot connect to my camera and tether through Capture One. The good news is Olympus Capture is wicked fast in terms of rendering. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for the super chat. Really, really appreciate it. Okay. So, um, Joe, basically what I would recommend is, number one, check the software that you're interested in using and make sure that it supports your, your camera brand. Pretty much any of the softwares will let you know specifically if they do. If you... Go to my website, and in fact, I will um, pull this up here really quick just to make sure that I can find it quickly. Um, see if I can find you the article. Yep, so here, I'm going to share this, and I will share the link with you guys. I have an article on my website, um, along with the video, The Best Software for Shooting Tethered. It has a whole breakdown of softwares that are available. You can see the, the list all the way down here. And actually, I should even update this because I think there's some new ones that have come out since then. Um, so the way I would approach it, Joe, is find the software that you would like, see if that software supports your camera, and then go from there. And do understand, since you mentioned Capture One, Capture One is awesome, super feature-loaded software, does lots of amazing things. It has a wicked learning curve. Let's just call it what it is. So I'm not trying to discourage anybody to use it, but I'm just letting you know, if you're going to spend the money for Capture One, do not pull that credit card out of your pocket and start typing the information in unless you are committed to setting aside time to really learn how to use it. Because otherwise, you will waste your money. Okay? All right. So um, we had a couple other questions that came in our lot. I don't have a lot of questions here, gang. So type away. Come on, how can I help you? But I have a new feature. I put out the request in my Facebook group this past week to kind of get the ball rolling. And I'm going to share the link with you folks now. I have not added it to the show notes, but I will. So it'll be there after I finish the show tonight. I will add it. But what I want to be able to do as we go forward with Talk Chat, and you know me, I'm going to try new things. I'm going to keep trying new things, and we're going to keep experimenting. But I want to get you folks more involved in the show. In fact, I literally want to get you in the show. What do I mean? So what I'm doing is I'm sharing a link with you right now. 
that will allow you to record a video question for me that I will answer on Talk Chat. And I will show the question. Doesn't have to be amazing lighting, doesn't have to be super big production, doesn't even have to be high quality sound. I mean, you know, try and do it in a quiet place. Don't do it in the middle of a traffic jam with all kind of noise, right? But I want you to be a part of the show. Every week we come here and we see these names and we talk to each other. Let's see each other, gang. Come out from behind the words. So tonight, our brave starter comes from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And here's his question. Hi, Joe. My name is John Bivens. And my question for you is this. I have a few different size octoboxes and a few different sizes umbrellas. I prefer to shoot with my umbrellas, but I was wondering what is the best practice or what is the rule uh, for using one versus the other one? Thanks. So John, that's a great question. And first of all, thank you for being brave enough to be the first person to record a video question for me. And I really do, gang, I wanna see you. So record me some questions, follow that link. So John, in answer to your question about choosing between umbrellas and octoboxes and what's the rule, which is the best one to go with, you may anticipate I'm gonna start with that one word that you used, it's the bad word, and that's rule. There is no rule, I, I hate rules. What I would suggest, John, is that you kind of tweak the way you think about modifiers a little bit. And I think that then will make your decision easier. And I'll tell you what, what my preferences are, but, but I, I wanna go up to kind of 30,000 feet first to try and instead of giving you a rule, kind of give you like a, a guideline to work with, right? So understand that modifiers, umbrellas, beauty dishes, octoboxes, parabolo uh, parabolic soft boxes, brolly boxes, and the list goes on, right? They are just tools. They modify the light. Each one of them modifies the light slightly differently. For those of you, if you've watched my videos, my tutorials, you know that I have a video. In fact, let me see if I can find it here just to share the link with you guys. I'm gonna type in beauty dish. In this video right here, and I will, will give you guys the link. I use a $6 shoot through umbrella and I match the light. In other words, I replicate the light that you get from a very expensive beauty dish using a $6 umbrella. So the other thing to understand about all these different light modifiers, folks, is that they really, really only help you. In other words, having a lot of them, it really only helps you if you actually understand. You ready? Here come those three words. So for those of you that are a little skittish, hang on tight. You have to understand the inverse square law. You just do. You're never, it's a big word. It's a daring word. You're never going to master lighting without developing an understanding of the inverse square law. So that being said, I will tell all of you this, and John, this may help you kind of sort out your answer. I have two modifiers that I use primarily. One, a shoot through umbrella, 32 inches, uh, made by Westcott. I believe they now sell for about $21. When I got mine, they were only $19, but that was a few years ago. The other one is a uh, 65 centimeter, which is about, I think, 26 or 30 inches in diameter, collapsible softbox by Fotix. It's the Fotix Raja. 65. Um, they call it a collapsible beauty dish. It does come with a removable deflector plate. I've never used it as a beauty dish. When I'm lighting with a beauty dish, I prefer to use a, a metal dish, but we'll get to that. So the Photix Raja and the Shoot Through Umbrella, those are my two kind of go-tos. How do I decide between one or the other? Well, think about it. I already have pretty much thrown down the challenge that says I can make the same kind of light with the umbrella as I can with the softbox. However, by design, an umbrella, since it's got that curved front, if I'm gonna 
throw light through it, or for that matter, if I'm going to reflect light off of it, if it's not a translucent umbrella, it's going to throw light everywhere, right? Umbrellas are not what you would call efficient. They're not really narrowing down the light. They're not restricting the light. They're essentially working either as a big reflector to bounce light off of or as a big diffuser to throw light through, to soften the light. Super simple. That's part of what's so great about umbrellas. They're just easy, but indeed they're not efficient. You tend to waste a little bit of light. And when I say waste, meaning there's a lot going on that's not impacting your picture. And depending on the space that you're shooting in, you may not be able to control the light enough with regards to your background or other elements in your photo with an umbrella. So if we go to the softbox, now we've got, you know, a defined shape that is going to essentially retard the spread of the light. This is where the inverse square law stuff comes in. It's going to retard the initial spread of the light that keeps the light a little bit more focused. On that softbox, if needed, if you're in a very tight space and you're having problems with your light spilling onto the background or spilling onto other parts of the shot, you can go to a grid, you know, face and, and you can retard the spread of the light even further. So they're both tools. They both kind of have their benefits. There's no answer that says, well, an umbrella is better than a softbox or a softbox is better than an umbrella. It's a matter of solving a problem. And then the same if you, so my third choice of lighting modifier, you might guess already, it is a beauty dish. Before any of you run out and buy beauty dishes, please understand beauty dishes make really, really bad light. In order to get great light out of a beauty dish, you have to finesse it, meaning you need to understand what you're doing or you're just wasting your money and you're creating harsh, ugly light. But when you set a beauty dish up right, you're going to get a really nice, even and beautiful rapid fall off of the light because of the way that dish wraps. Okay, And that's exactly the why and the when of why would I use a beauty dish if I want that kind of high-end soft light that is going to have a rapid fall off. Normally, when you've got a rapid fall off of light, that makes for a harsh shadow line somewhere. With a beauty dish, you're able, when you position it properly at the right distance and you're factoring in the inverse square law, you're able to make it a very soft fall off, but a fall off that happens very, very rapidly. And it just really accentuates features, brings out the jawline. It's, it's gorgeous. So those are kind of some guidelines, John, as to how I make my choices. But honestly, there's really no rule. So for those of you that are still struggling to really get your hands and your head wrapped around lighting, and for those of you that have maybe gotten ahead of yourself, I will tell you this. If you want to know, like, what's the best modifier to start with? We'll go there. I would tell you start with an umbrella and start cheap. Now, indeed, depending on what you're shooting, depending on what your style of shooting is, you may need to progress to a softbox fairly quickly. But honestly, umbrella, hands down, best way to learn lighting and modifying light. Because you can give me an umbrella, like a 26 or 32 inch umbrella, shoot through, transparent or translucent, excuse me. I will replicate the light from any modifier that you can find. You can give me a parabolic dish. You can give me a softbox. You can give me a beauty dish. I will replicate it with the umbrella. But I'm going to do it with years of experience and understanding of the inverse square law, which is the physics behind how light works. Every photographer who is going to create consistently good photographs, remember my mission statement, right? If you're going to create consistently good work, you've got to understand, thoroughly understand the inverse square law. And you have to master its applications. You just do. Don't be afraid of it. Dive in. You got to screw up a lot of pictures to get there, but that's what you need to do. So John, I hope that helps. Thank you for being the first to record a video question for me. So for the rest of you, Come on, think of a question. We're not going to put it on tonight. In other words, you know, I'm going to put one or two on each week. So if you record one tonight or tomorrow, you'll be in next week's 
show. Okay. All right. So let me scroll on up here. I had a couple questions that came in early and I saw a few more just came in. So let's see from Jean Edward here. Let me switch over to the question window. There we go. And I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit. His question is, what would be your opinion on a reasonable amount of time to spend on a no obligation consultation call? Uh, and then, of course, a follow up email with a prospect. Jean Edward, um, you're probably not going to like my answer. I mean, I, I understand why you're asking the question. Uh, Jean Edward is a member of my my mentoring group. So I, I understand where he's at and kind of where this question is coming from. And he's, he's going through the learning curve right now of realizing that some clients, oftentimes clients that aren't actually big clients, in other words, aren't actually paying you a lot of money, some clients are time sucks, meaning they're needy, meaning they need a lot of attention, meaning they have more questions than you want to have to deal with. And if they're tire kickers, and they haven't actually become a client yet, that can be painful to deal with. So, John Edward, unfortunately, the answer is, I'm not going to give you an answer that you want. You want me to give you a number to say like 15 minutes or 30 minutes. That is a bad idea. Because the simple fact of the matter is, just like every human being is different, just like every photographer is different, you can't try and fit everybody into the same little mold. What you have to do is you actually have to apply a little bit of psychology. You have to get smarter. And it is. The onus, unfortunately, is on you to get smarter at automating where you can automate. And folks, now that I said that, I want to be really, really clear. I am in no way suggesting that you automate everything to the point where you are not talking to your clients. That is a Horrible, horrible business idea. But I mean, automated to the sense of that when you do send uh, an email to a client and say, listen, you know, let's schedule a call. I'm going to talk for 15 minutes. I'll, actually, I'll give you one great example. One of the things that so many people do, and it, it, it boggles my mind. My wife, you folks know, she is a college professor. So I know this isn't just a college professor thing, but I watch her and her colleagues do this and it just... It makes my head want to explode. Somebody in the department will send out an email and say, hey, we should have a meeting about this. And then three other people will respond and say, yeah, we should. And then somebody will finally say, when do you guys want to meet? And that's an email. This is an email that gets sent. And then two people will respond back and say, well, I'm not available tomorrow or the next day. You notice nobody has said yet, let's meet on this date. Like no one has yet proposed a meeting date, okay? And then eventually somebody will say, how about this day at two o'clock? And then within seconds, somebody will write back and say, I'm not available. End of the email. How is that helpful? Why not say, I'm not available. Can we do it at three o'clock? Or can we do it the next day at two o'clock, right? And so literally they will, they will trade 20, 30 emails for the purpose of trying to schedule an appointment. So when I talk about automating, what I mean is like, yeah, so, okay, somebody says, hey, um, they send you an email and it's an inquiry from your website. And, you know, I'd like to talk to you about doing this. And they give you, they always give you a little bit of information, but of course it's never enough information. It's never all the information that you need. So ideally you want to get them on the phone. But if you can't get them on the phone and you're going to email back, email them back and say, I would love to help you out. I'm going to need a little bit more information. So how about if we chat by phone? Are you available tomorrow at one o'clock? Now you have put the pressure, not pressure, but you've put the onus on them to come back and say, yes, life is easy then. Or I can't do one o'clock, but I could talk to you the next day at one o'clock, right? So it streamlines things. It, it tends to automate things. When you are prepared, when it's time for that call, then you need to be prepared with the questions that you need to ask. And you want to cover, you want to get the who, what, why, when, where, and how, and as much detail as possible at that point so that you can either give them the answer they're looking for right then and there, or so that you can say to them, you know what, this information is really, really helpful. I'm very interested in the project, but I don't want to overbid or underbid. That wouldn't be fair to you or me. Please give me 24 hours 
I will have an, in, a quote to you, a proposal in the email tomorrow, right? And then you're going to follow up that way. Um, but the thing of it is, John Edward, depending on the project, depending on the client, depending on, on the size of what they're doing, you may be able to do a 10 minute phone call or you may need a two hour phone conversation. So you kind of have to judge. Obviously you don't wanna just open it up so that somebody can just be chit chatty and, and eat up your whole afternoon for a portrait, right? I understand that. But that's where you, you, know, you have to kind of learn how to manage it. But don't put yourself in a box of saying, well, everybody gets 15 minutes. That's a really bad idea because then you're going to have some potentially very, very valuable clients that are gonna feel very rushed and feel like you're not giving them the attention that they both deserve because of the size of the project and that of course that they want, right? So that would be my advice there. All right, next up, let's see here. From David Barrett, uh, Joe, have your recommendations for a website hosting company changed at all since your website marketing videos a few years back? I've watched a few of them and uh, just weigh my options for my website. David, my, my recommendations have not changed. Um, at the time that I did those videos, I was recommending a company called Format, which is a Canadian-based company. Uh, I still strongly recommend them. So my website gang is actually a WordPress website. However, if you click on my portfolio, which you can find the link at the top of every page, you notice the URL changes, well, you can't see it here on YouTube, but the URL changes to photos.joeedelman.com. This is a format website. In fact, way down in the bottom, you can see it says using format. Uh, so I use format for my uh, portfolio. All of the other links on here, like about Joe, they go back to my, my WordPress website. Why do I like format? Format is similar I hate to make the comparison, but everybody knows Squarespace and everybody's very familiar with Squarespace. It's similar to Squarespace, but better. Less expensive, more features, more ability to easily modify the pages and make them your own. The challenge that you have, gang, when you use a templated website, which is what most of you need, most of, please believe me, 99% of you, probably 99.5% of you, do not need WordPress websites. So don't build a WordPress website unless you legit need a WordPress website. I have a lot of special programming and things built into mine, which is why I need that because I can't do that in a templated website. So you wanna go with a templated website, but you want to be able to make modifications to it. And when I say modifications, I don't mean add a page or change the font, but I mean, make sure that it doesn't look like every other photographer who's hosting on that same platform. The problem with Squarespace is you can go to a photographer's website and you can tell in two seconds they're on Squarespace. It's like they, they really don't have that big a variety of templates that look great for photographers. And they're not super easy to modify. And you can't modify them as much. Format allows you to do much more modifying. And Format basically was founded and built as a website design setup for creatives, meaning photographers, artists, illustrators, et cetera. So all of their templates are designed with that category in mind. So yes, I still strongly recommend them. I'm not sponsored by them, folks. Uh, they did sponsor a few, full disclosure, FTC, we have to make sure we're saying the right things. They did sponsor a few talk chats about two and a half years ago. But um, yeah, I highly recommend them. Uh, I, I don't make any money off them. I don't have an affiliate link for you, I, but I would encourage you. And they do have a, a free trial. So you can try out and actually build most of your website out without actually having to pay any money. So I would, uh, you know, I would check them out for sure. Okay. All right. Let me just see here what we have next. Uh, scrolling down through the interview. And I know there's a couple questions that came in right afterwards. And Paul Sutton here, uh, I think this is a follow-up to uh, what I was talking about before with the software. I'm learning Affinity Photo from Adobe Lightroom. What do you suggest as the best mindset to learning a new piece of software to improve my photography? Well, Paul, um, I don't know that I would necessarily say that going from Lightroom to Infinity is going to improve your photography. 
Um, certainly, we could argue fairly that Affinity has some capabilities that Lightroom doesn't have. Um, I have found that most of the people that make that switch, and I don't mean this to sound like a negative to Affinity, I'm just, just keeping it real, right? Um, I found that most people who make the switch from like Lightroom to Affinity are doing it because they've got to bug up their butts about Adobe and they either don't want to pay Adobe's prices or they don't want to pay for the Adobe, you know, subscriptions, et cetera. And if that's your situation, cool, fine, whatever. It's not up to me to, you know, tell you how to spend your money. Um, what I would say though, to answer your question in terms of what's the best mindset about learning a new piece of software, honestly, the best mindset is to be open-minded. And, and understand that anytime you make a change like that, it's no different if you ch decide to change camera brands or, you know, you change any kind of software or um, if you change who your website host is, any of that, there's going to be a learning curve. And we tend, and believe me, I know I suffer from this. You know, we, we tend to do so much multitasking today and we tend to have so much going on that we're always in a hurry to do the learning, right? We, we, we want the learning to happen really fast. And unfortunately, when it comes to processing, there's no quick learning. There, there really isn't. Not if you are going to uh, get good at it. Not if you are going to really, um, if you're, you're going to really be able to, to master what you're doing. Okay. So uh, I would just, you know, go at it with a, an, an open mindset. Okay. Cool. All right. Next question that is here. From Jessica, and Jessica, I think you're involved in a conversation about posing stools, and I'm seeing some answers come by. Sit tight, because the answers are leaving out a very, very important piece of information about posing stools. So I'll get to your question, okay? How do you back up your images, photo storage and copies, either stored on a cloud server, USB, external hard drive, et cetera? Well, Jessica, a couple of things here. Number one, I have a video all about that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a link to the video that is on my YouTube channel. In fact, here, I'll switch over so you can see it. It's called Photo Backup right here. Um, so let me copy that link and I'm gonna share it here in the chat. Um, and I will also tell you, and I believe I have one scheduled. Let me switch back to my website, click on the presentations page and I wanna scroll down here. I should know this. There it is. Um, sorry, that's not it. Uh, yeah, it is right there. File management for photographers on February 25th. Uh, I would encourage you to consider signing up for that. Um, the primary focus of the, and by the way, it's free. It's a free presentation. The primary focus of, or sorry, $5. It's a $5 presentation. The primary focus of this presentation is about file management structure. In other words, folders and things like that and being able to find your pictures. However, the um, last third of this presentation gets into storage gets into cloud backup services, what I use, et cetera. The short version is just on the chance that maybe you understand the, the tech terms uh, for my hard drive and my USB connected hard drives, I use the personal version of Backblaze for offsite backup. In-house, I back up all my files to a Synology drive. I have a, a 65 terabyte Synology drive here, that drive gets backed up to the Backblaze cloud. So that's two separate services from Backblaze. Um, so that way I have everything offsite, onsite, uh, in you know multiple versions of it, but everything's automated. So I don't have to touch a thing to make it happen. So we do talk about it in that, in that presentation, okay? And let's see, and, and Paul, he's got a follow up here. Um, he said, I mentioned uh, the learning curve. And yes, when I was talking about Affinity One, I basically told you the same thing. There, there is definitely any new, any new software, there's going to be a learning curve. I don't mean this as a, as a negative to Capture One because Capture One deserves it. Capture One's got a bigger learning curve than any of them. The, the biggest reason to go with Capture One, in my opinion, so this is an opinion, the biggest reason to use Capture One, if you want to consider that, is for their color tools, their ability to manage skin tones and things like that. There are a lot of other great features, right? But, but that's hands down, nobody comes close to what they can do. But trust me, you're not gonna go pay your money, download that software and be doing cool things with color like that. It's a serious learning curve. 
So if you're not going to commit to that learning curve, don't waste your money, right? So, um, okay, next one along here. So from Jessica, most camera stools, stores, excuse me, do not sell posing stools. Where do you recommend buying model posing products? So first of all, Jessica, I'm going to recommend, I have a feeling you haven't been watching me that long. I'm going to recommend stop thinking of the idea of posing people. Pose, it's a four-letter word. You should remember what your mother taught you. Don't use four-letter words. Now, do I put my models on a stool? Do I put my portrait subjects on a stool? Frequently, not always, but frequently. You can use any kind of a stool. You could use a bar stool. Depends on how tall you are. A bar stool may make your subject too tall. Uh, you can use, I saw somebody recommended a drummer stool. You can do that with a caveat. There's a caveat to the drummer stool. I'm going to get to that, okay? Um, you can use any kind of stool. What I use, in fact, here, um, let me see if I can find you one really quick on Amazon. And I will gladly share the link with you, Okay. Um, and you can actually find this, if I remember correctly, uh, they actually have it listed. Yeah, so here, I will, I'll share my, my screen. So here, I just did a quick search on Amazon for posing stools, and I want you to look at two different stools here. Forget this one, because this one's tall. So unless you're really tall, don't go with a stool like that, right? But there's this one right here for $68, and there's this one right here for $34. Most people are going to gravitate to the $34 one because they're going to take a quick look at it and say, well, yeah, you know what? Like, this is like half the price and it's got wheels. Trust me, Jessica, don't use a posing stool with wheels. So to the best of my knowledge, most drummers stools don't have wheels, but I'm sure some probably do. So just make sure if you go with a drummer stool, don't get one with wheels. The reason why you don't want one with wheels, so yes, you want to pay a few extra bucks. And I can tell you this flashpoint posing stool, uh, what's great about it is it's got a it's got a little meat to it. It's it's solid, right? So let me let me get a link here. Uh, I will tell you straight up, this is an affiliate link. Um, you don't have to use it. If you use it, I'll make a couple pennies. But um, there. So the reason why I, I recommend that is one, it's a little bit heavier, it's a little bit more substantial. And two, if you get a stool with wheels, you will have nervous subjects rolling all around your studio while you're trying to shoot them. It's bad enough on a stool. The first thing a nervous subject does is like, uh, uh, uh. yeah, I'm on a stool, right? But I'm on one with, without wheels, okay? Uh, so trust me, don't get the wheels. You will regret the wheels, okay? Because you'll, you'll have subjects that you'll literally be chasing around your studio trying to keep them where you need them for your lighting and, and everything else. But you are correcting your observation, Jessica. Most camera stores don't sell posing stools at this point, okay? All right, let's see what else we got here. Scrolling down, Prodigy Child, do I teach uh, photo editing? Uh, I do, so it just so happens. Now, it depends on what you wanna define as editing. So I'll come back to that in a second, but um, tomorrow night, the secret powers of raw files is really what the majority of you need to know about processing your files. So I wanna be really clear, Prodigy Child, about um, what exactly is photo editing. Photo editing is actually the process of selecting this frame instead of this frame, right? It's culling, developing, processing, that's what we do to make the pictures look great, right? It's the developing part of the pictures. So if you're asking, do I teach classes on processing? Yes, I have one tomorrow night. It's two hour live interactive presentation. It's only $10, okay? And I just realized it's, I'm like 10 minutes past time here. Shocker, right? So here, last question, Claudio. Um, let's get this one here. Although it may not be your specialty, how do you shoot uh, to emphasize the snow falling, the snowflakes in the air? Um, not my specialty, but it's really simple. I mean, basically snowflakes are light in color, right? And they're falling, sometimes rapidly. So you're gonna need a slightly um, faster shutter speed if you want to stop them, if you don't want them blurry, and try and frame them against a darker background, right? Um, if you are shooting white on white, it's gonna be very hard to see in the snowflakes. So you want to try and pick angles and, and positions where you've got darker areas 
behind the snowflakes, and that's going to make the snowflakes show up. One other option, but this is extremely hit or miss, and it can be really, really harsh in lighting, is to actually use a flash on your camera and light the snowflakes. But that's the kind of thing you're usually only going to do for essentially an effect, so to speak. Um, the biggest thing is just try and find a, a dark area behind them so that you've got the lighter snowflakes on the darker area. Okay? All right, gang. That about wraps things up for this week. I'm only 10 minutes over time. Great questions tonight, though. Thank you very much. And thank you for tuning in for another great night of chatting about all things photography. Please don't forget to download the podcast to hear the rest of the interview with the amazing Benjamin Von Wong. I hope to see you again next Wednesday. In the meantime, gang, stay safe and stay healthy. And of course, whatever you do, please remember these words. Thanks for watching this episode of Talk Chat. Don't forget to download this week's podcast for even more Todd knowledge. The link is in the show notes. Now go and pick up that camera and shoot something because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios.